And then, now that that was Washington, ungentlemanly or not, I would have shot him right then and there and ended the revolution. Because without him, there was no revolution. So, um, Washington wins. Following the war, Congress promised bonuses to anybody who stayed enlisted from beginning to end. Congress, all of a sudden, were penny pinchers. And the army was going to mutiny. Washington fronts that money and says, don't worry, guys. I will make Congress pay. You have my word. Stopping a mutiny. November 2nd, 1783, he probably made the decision that he was recognized internationally for more than anything else. He gives his farewell address to the army. Um, he separates from them his farewell address in November. He resigns December 23rd as head of the Continental Army. People are shocked. You're the head of the army that just beat the British. You can take that and do whatever you want. He says, no. I was elected to be the general. The war is over. I'm going back home. King George III, his nemesis, says, this is the man has the greatest character in the world. This was the greatest act in his life. No one, no one would do this except George Washington, the greatest character of his age. Um, to answer Ryan's question, throughout the war, Washington fronted $450,000. Quarter, you know, think about that. Almost half a million dollars he spends on the war effort. He hopes it will get reimbursed by Congress. Some of it does, some of it does not. So now Washington, he's tired. He just wants to go home. But they're like, no, man, you got to go to that Constitutional Convention. And he shows up in 1787, and he goes, look, you know, I don't know about this. He goes, but these Articles of Confederation, this stuff sucks. This is a rope of sand, all right? We need a strong central government to keep us all unified. And it was because of his support saying that, look, we need to do something different that our Constitution, and James Madison writes it, revises it, and is adopted mainly because of his support. When the Founding Fathers, everyone but him, tries to figure out who's going to run this Constitution, they went back through records and they looked at the old Roman office of consul. And they said, that's a pretty good outline, but who can we trust to do this? The only guy they could think of was Washington. They said, we'll make him the first president, and we'll write down everything he does, and those will be the precedents from what we will follow. What he does is what we're going to do from that point on. That's how much trust people had in him. He is president. He is the only guy ever in both elections to receive 100% of all electoral votes. Not a vote is cast for anybody else. Now, yes, he is the first one, but there are a lot of guys who wanted this job. He's the one guy who didn't want it, and he wins anyway by a unanimous vote. Um, he wanted to waive his salary. He's like, look, I'm pretty good. They're like, no, because theoretically this office is open to any American. They may not have your wealth, so they may need the salary. So he is told he will get a salary very solid for the day of $25,000 to be the first American president. Um, a lot of things, you want to be known as Caesar, you want to be known as Imperator, Emperor, King, and he says, classic George Washington, Mr. President will be just fine. What? What's that? Uh -huh. Mr. President will be just fine. That's what you can call me, President Washington. Um, several things he does, we still do to this day, sending a message to Congress, all right? the State of the Union Address, started by Washington. He got his trusted aides and allies. He was really careful after Benedict Arnold's treason to pick people that he could totally trust to be his advisors in the cabinet. And he said, I, stre I cannot stress enough tolerance 
when talk, talking to opposition political parties. Two of his trusted aides hated each other. One was Alexander Hamilton, Washington's chief of staff through the war, and the other one was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson and Hamilton hated each other. But Washington liked both of them. He liked to have them both in the same room. He goes, gentlemen, don't yell. I need to hear both sides. There is something valid to be hearing two perspectives. He goes, but when it comes time to making decisions, Washington didn't waffle. When it was time, he made the decision, and that was it. He would listen, but when his mind was made up, there was no changing it. Um, he declines to run for a third term. He goes, no, that is more like a dictator or a king. I'm tired. I'm done. I am going home. Um, he lays plans to um, create a national bank, national currency, to establish credit, and like running Mount Vernon, he wanted a very financially sound government and country. We're going to do things the right way. We're not going to spend it until we have it or most of it. He helps pick out um, the location for the nation's capital. Um, he is the only president never to live in the White House. One thing that goes wrong, when Thomas Jefferson spoke out against a national bank, Washington says, Tom, relax, we're going to do this. Thomas Jefferson says, well, you have my resignation. Washington says, Tom, relax, I'm not going to accept your resignation. You can't have everything your own way. Jefferson says, fine, but if you're not going to listen to me, I quit, I'm going home. That really upset Washington, and he never forgave Jefferson. The two never reconciled, the two um, great Virginians. Um, when war breaks out in France, um, and war um, break out, breaks out between England and France, Washington stays out. His very good friend was the Marquis de Lafayette. He says, Lafayette, I want to help, but we're too fragile. We're, we have no money. I'd love to come help you, but now is not the right time. And so he proclaims American neutrality. When Napoleon gets crazy and, and, and the French Revolution is going on, Washington's like, look, man, hands off, all right? We want ours. We'll show you how to do it. What you're doing is not the right way. The French send over a diplomat, Edmund Genet, who begins to go from Philadelphia and Boston and New York, calling Washington out, making fun of him, calling Washington. He's okay until he calls Washington a coward. Washington sends a letter to Genet and to the French and says, I ask you to immediately recall him to your country because if he stays here beyond three months, I'm going to pay him a visit and show him what a coward I really am. The French immediately send a dispatch down from Canada, get Genet the heck out of America before Washington kills him. So that's it for Mr. Um, Genet. Um, he is pulled from the country. Uh, September 19, 1796, Washington is tired. He wants to go home. He gives his farewell address. He leaves New York, and he heads to Mount Vernon when the leaves are changing and it's the nice autumn. And when he's done, Washington spells out this in his national address. Number one, or his farewell address, national unity. For America to succeed, the first true democracy since A Athens, we must be one people. Follow the Constitution and the rule of law. It's flexible, we wrote it to change, but make sure you adhere to it. All right? It's written this way for a reason. Number three, we could really use this today, all right? Be wary of political parties and log jams. I understand people have different perspectives, but don't let it stop you from taking care of the people. He goes, we are a Republican people. We have a choice of who we can elect. So make sure you vote and do your job. Now, again, he's speaking to, you know, rich white guys, but still, you get to vote. You get to choose. 
He's like, be careful of foreign affairs. All right? Do not let them influence what we do. We're a different nation for a reason. We left there to come here. So focus on America and don't get sucked in to European battles. They've been doing it for a millennium. Be careful. And he said, again, move beyond partisanship and work for the common good. Don't get stuck in your own ideology. And as a result, the guy internationally that Washington is most often compared to is the Roman dictator Cincinnatus, who was found plowing his field when told he was elected dictator. He goes up to France and saves a Roman army without shedding one drop of blood. They come back to Rome. Everybody, you know, the Romans, they're partying, having a good time. They wake up the next day and they're going, where's Cincinnati? You've seen Cincinnati? Where's Cincinnati? I don't know. They can't find him anywhere. They ride out to his farm and what's Cincinnati doing? He's plowing his field. All right? He's like, well, you got like five more months of unlimited power. He's like, no, the law says I'm dictator for six months or until the crisis is solved. Crisis is solved, I'm going to plow my field. But no, like you could have somebody plow the field for you. He's like, no, that would be a breach of the law. I'm going to plow my field. This uh, um, government goes back to the Senate. That is what Lincoln did. He gave up, he could have used the art Lincoln. Oh, ooh, told you. That's what Washington did. He gives up his military power. He could have stayed in power for as long as he wanted to. By this time, he said, I just want to go home and hang out on my farm and make super cow, stuff like that. And so um, he dies December 14th, 1799. And they asked him what he thought of the country. And his last words are supposedly to be, tis well. He dies. Over in Europe, Napoleon had all the church bells of France um, rung, and he declares a 10-day um, memorial for what he called um, the leading man of his century. And Washington is eulogized by uh, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee. Robert E. Lee's dad gives the last speech at Washington's funeral where he goes, even his Enemies respected him. King George called him the greatest man of his age. That's why Washington will forever be first in war, first um, in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. So if we take a quick rundown of Washington, being the first to speak out against the, the British taxes, calling for the Constitutional Convention, accepting the very thankless, miserable job of leading the army, and attacking the Hessians on Christmas night are some of the really key things he did to propel him to the presidency, and he sets the, sets the stage for and everybody else. Along with, at the end of eight years, saying, you know what, and when they, when they tell you, Whatever you do is what we're going to write down for what everybody else to follow. Pretty much he can do. I'm figuring out still in class. I'm sorry. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants. And he goes, no, eight is enough. Any more than that, and it'll look like a dictatorship. Very few people can give up that type of... Now, he's super rich, but if you think about it, when did he ever get to enjoy that? Hardly at all, a couple years before he dies. So um, that is Washington's leadership. He's a pretty long one, and it's 810. God, this is good. All right, <laughs> got this. All right, we'll go through Jefferson. All right, you guys ready for a quick jump into Thomas? He's not quite as long. Um, Jefferson, uh, number two, expansion. Born in what is today Gordonsville, um, Virginia, um, 1743. Brilliant guy. Early on, everybody knows some about this Jefferson. This cat is smart. He sees things just differently. And I was talking last week, you know, when you go to Monticello, and there's that little glass phone booth looking out over the valley. And I think that he was a lonely guy, because, again, he was so smart. Like, who could he talk to? 
you know, you were talking to that really brilliant person, they say stuff, and you're like, yeah. No idea what you just said, but, you know, yeah, right, yeah, right. You know, so he just stood there just thinking all the time. You know, this is the man who took um, two weather readings, no matter where he was in the world, for over 60 years. Just brilliant, dedicated, probably a little OCD, you know, things had to work in his way, you know, engineering mind. Um, and he attends William and Mary, where he just can't pick a subject that he likes. One of his favorites was foreign language. And he said he taught himself Italian at William and Mary in 12 days. Uh, reading Dante's Inferno. All right, so he's clearly smart, and he loved the Enlightenment thinkers. John Locke, you know, life, liberty, property. Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton were his guys. Scientists, thinkers, philosophers, and he loved them. He gets through William and Mary two years because he's just smarter than everybody else. And he begins to, to be a law clerk. So he goes to Virginia, or to um, House of Burgesses, um, representing Albemarle County, the big powerful county in Virginia, for six years. And he's a whiz kid, all right? He just sees things, and he writes things, and he has um, all of these ideas, and some of them are radical and very unpopular. And this is why Jefferson always takes a lot of heat. Now, I have this crazy idea, I tell the students, feel free to laugh, that when you get to heaven as a history teacher, there's like a kiosk and a big keyboard. And one of the things you can do is type in a name and get to meet that person. You can ask them five questions. Well, Jefferson's in my top five. Be like, Tom, I've got a question. Love you. However, this whole Declaration of Independence without freeing your slaves thing, like, why? Just, you know, do it. Then no one can question you and you're good forever. I really want his answer to that one. Because way back... Here, he introduces legislation where slave masters should be able to decide when their slaves are free. At this time, you had to ask the royal governor if it was okay to free your slave. He's like, well, how is the royal governor going to know? He's, you know, way up there and we're out here. That should be an individual right of the slave owner. So this is going to be the reoccurring theme throughout um, his life. Um, following the Intolerable Acts, the Stamp Act, the Sugar Tax, and all that stuff, um, he writes a summary of everything he felt the British did wrong to the Americans from his new estate at Monticello. It means Little Mountain in Italian. And that is what he takes to Philadelphia. He unfurls that thing. People are like, oh yeah, that's good, that's good. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Oh, man. And it's pretty much Jefferson's ideas that were written out and what really propels um, a lot of these states to vote for um, independence. It's Washington's, um, you know, and John Adams speaking, and it's Jefferson's writing. He was a much better writer than he was a speaker. He didn't like public speaking. He was much more eloquent as a writer. And he goes, I feel that people have the right to govern themselves. These are all injustices that are, are done. So he's in the Second Continental Congress. He's one of the youngest members there. And he seeks out the leaders, John Adams and Sam Adams, the rabble-rousing cousins from Massachusetts. And they listen to him, and they look at the way he writes, and those guys just use the language that we just can't anymore. Not that we can't, we just don't. Their command of the verbal and written language was so much better than ours. And they're like, Tom, God, dude, you, you write really good. So what we need you to do is take all of those thoughts and put it into a, well, I don't want to do that. There was a team of five guys that were assigned to it. For Jefferson is the main one. June 28, 1776, he's finished. A quarter of it is stricken. And this, the part that's deleted causes, there's actually a big fight between tiny little John Adams of Massachusetts and William Rutledge of South Carolina. They actually get into a fist fight on the floor 
of in Philadelphia. It's Ben Franklin was like a hundred, like breaks them up. And it was about slavery. Jefferson said, well, if we're talking about, you know, every, you know, every, every man is created equal, we've got to free the slaves. Rutledge was the biggest slave owner. He goes, no, the southern states won't sign it unless that clause is stricken. So after a big hubbub, it gets deleted. But everyone says that slavery is a dying institution, and it's Franklin that says it. Let's win independence first, and then we will deal with the issue of slavery. It should die out 20, within 20 years of our winning um, independence. But it's the all men are created equal thing that if you ask anybody, it's probably one of the best, most well-known sentences and phrases in the English language. Go anywhere, talk about America, and that is one of the phrases that is going to come up. So, um, as a member of Congress, Jefferson, when he's done, We'll look at the unclaimed territory over the Appalachian Mountains. What is, you know, Ohio, Indiana, you know, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And he'll say, that territory shouldn't belong to the 13 states. We should do something different with it. These are some of the unknown things that, that Jefferson does. He draws the borders for nine new states. They become known as the Northwest Territories. And he writes the Northwest Ordinance, which is the ability for colonists to go into the Great Lakes states to take advantage of natural resources, but that area is forbidden to slaves. You cannot take slaves into that area. Throughout the war, he travels to France um, as our lead ambassador and is essential and getting them to come over to our side during the war. And while he's there, all right, while he's in France later on, the French Revolution breaks out. All right? Washington sends him over as Secretary of State, and while he's there, the um, Parisian peasants storm the Bastille. And he sits down with Lafayette, and he helps the French write their constitution Declaration of the Rights of a Man and a Citizen. And I always beat on that one in class. I'm like, can't you call it like the French Constitution? Ours is the Constitution. But the Declaration of the Rights of, I mean, come on. Like, really, I don't have to, all day to say what it is. And it doesn't work anyway. So that's all right. But anyway, um, while in Paris, he hears that Washington is thinking of leaving the presidency. And he says, no, you need to stay. We need you to stay for another term to stabilize the new country. The British are terrified of you, and the French love you. So stay on the job. When he returns home, um, uh, he has made the first Secretary of State. He wants to go to Monticello, and Washington says, no, I'm going to need you here to help me run my government. You asked me to stay, so now you've got to stay and help me. This is when... Um, he runs into problems with Washington and Alexander Hamilton over the strong central government. He says, no, that's what we fought against. And Hamilton and Washington say a confederacy is not going to work. There is not enough power. We're not together. People will only think about themselves. We need someone tying everything together. Jefferson says, who can do that, George, besides you? And he goes, someone will fill the job. They have to. So um, he becomes vice president to his former friend, John Adams. But he and Adams have grown apart. And Jefferson is a little sneaky here. During Adams' presidency, Jefferson, using his French connections, says, don't worry. Adams is going to be a one-termer. He's not going to last. So when he sends negotiations with you guys, draw them out, stall them. I'm going to run for president, and I'll get you guys a much better deal. He's undermining his boss. You've got to remember, at this time, the vice president is the guy who comes in second in the election. The president doesn't get to pick them. It's the number two guy. Jefferson's like, whatever. He turns out to be right. 
Um, and he wins the election of 1801. And being the odd Jefferson that he is, there's no big parade. There's no paparazzi waiting outside the, the Capitol building. He rides up by himself on a horse, puts his hand on the Bible and is sworn in, jumps off the horse and goes into the White House. That was it. No um, ceremony. But when he gets to the president, here's where Jefferson really um, takes off. First thing he does is he creates the United States Military Academy at West Point. He goes, we need a school to teach leadership and defense. Immediately upon that happening, everyone thought Jefferson was a softy. British, the British Navy and pirates from North Africa were shooting at our trading ships in the Mediterranean. Jefferson calls up the American fleet, says blow up the port cities of the Barbary pirates in Morocco and Tunisia and Libya, and if the British say anything, fire at them too. The hell with the Barbary pirates, this is America. He, Jefferson's not a big British fan. And if they want to go for it, let's go. Um, using his connections again with Napoleon, here is expansion. He makes the greatest land purchase of all time, 850,000 square miles for $12 million. What he does, unbeknownst to anybody at the time, and buys the largest fertile plain on the planet Earth for $12 million. bucks. He buys it. Um, he, by himself, this purchase makes the United States self-sufficient, not only in food production, but in a lot of mineral raw materials, allowing us to sustain ourselves with one. What do you mean, I can't do that? What? Like, I'm the president. No, you got to ask for the money first. Oh, well, sorry, Congress. He doesn't ask Congress before he signs the contract. It's like, oh, oops, <clears throat> didn't know that that's the way it worked. My bad. So Jefferson gets criticized. He hated a strong central government, but when he becomes president, he makes decisions based on a strong central government. Well, this, oops, sorry. Um, what it does is it ends British and French ambitions in North America. It also isolates Spain, and it is said to be the second most formative or important action in American history outside of winning the revolution. It's defeating the British and the Louisiana Purchase are the two big things that propel America eventually to national prominence. So from Louisiana all the way on up, if you were here last week, you got this. So you guys falling asleep yet? Are you guys still good? All right. All right. And so um, Jefferson not only sends out Lewis and Clark, he sends out um, William Dunbar and George Hunter to explore the Ouachita River, which runs from Arkansas down into Louisiana. He sends an expedition, um, the Freeman and Custis Expedition, into Texas, and the Zebulon Pike Expedition over the Rocky Mountains into the American Southwest. So Lewis and Clark get all the attention because theirs was the biggest, but under Jefferson's leadership, the South, the Deep South, the Rocky Mountains, and the Southwest are explored as well. They bring all that stuff back. Jefferson writes it down and says, sooner or later, we're going to get um, all of that. Um, Indian Removal Act. This is where it starts to get ugly. Um, Jefferson believed that the Indians should abandon their Native American culture and become more Western European. He immediately begins by removing the Shawnee and the Cherokee from North Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. He says they should be pushed to lands west of the Mississippi River, especially if you are an ally of the British in the Revolution. I have no mercy for you. So we'll kick you over the Mississippi into Arkansas or Oklahoma or whatever's out there. And he strikes a deal with the governor of Georgia, if you give up claims to Georgian land west of the Mississippi River, you won't have to raise a finger to get rid of the Cherokee. I'll do it for you. So the Cherokee are already being pushed out. And Jefferson says, our policy of westward expansion, we will advance incrementally. We will go slow 
as we multiply. The more of us there are, the farther we are going to go until we get the entire thing. Um, he does tell the army, and this is, ah, he goes, be careful. Don't start killing everybody, because when you do, when we raise a hatchet to eliminate an entire village, we're not going to stop. We won't be able to stop until that entire race is exterminated. So his warning proves out to be true as the Indians begin to be removed, Native Americans. Um, the rest of that story will come later. There will be virtually nothing left of their tribes and their culture. Um, 1807, he gets a law passed that the importation of slaves from um, outside is illegal. Slaves can no longer be imported. The ones that are here are fine, but no more are coming in. And um, we are able to take Florida from Spain. It's only a matter of time, so now we can vacation and have Disney World, things of that nature. All right. And the British, the stinking British, they're in American waters and they fire at a United States vessel, the USS Lexington. Jefferson says, whoa, 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 what's going on? He sends another ship to gain confirmation, the USS Chesapeake, and it's fired upon. And he's like, okay, the British obviously don't get it. He prepares for war. He calls for an embargo on British goods and says, if they interfere, we will protect our independence. The British were angry at Jefferson for his friendship with the French, and they thought he was a pushover. He wouldn't go to war if they pushed it. They found out that he um, was wrong. And he says that it is America that is trusted with the destinies. We are the solitary republic of the world. We are the monument to human rights and the sole depository of the sacred fire of freedom. We are the light of the world. People are looking at us as a free and independent government. We have created it from virtually nothing. We are now an icon to the world. That's what he says as he leaves office. And in the Jefferson Memorial, around the rotunda, he says, I have a sworn duty to protect the mind of man from tyranny. That is my sole job. And when asked about what he was proud of, he said three things. So number one was the Declaration of Independence. Number two was establishing the University of Virginia. And number three was having Virginia be a state where there was religious toleration. Like all the stuff that you did, he's like, nope, those are my big three things. He did a lot more, um, you know, inventor, planter. But his big decisions are clearly writing the um, Declaration and buying the Louisiana Purchase and maintaining that friendship with the French throughout his presidency. Does a lot, um, kind of key, his big thing is getting us, he doubles the United States in size in one stroke of the pen. All right, it's 8.30. Here are my thoughts. Start Lincoln. All right. We got Lincoln, we have Roosevelt, and then next week we are going to, we are going to do Martha Washington, um, Claire Barton, and I pulled out Sacagawea because we did a lot of her last week, and I threw in, um, got a mind blanking right now, oh my god, um, Nancy McAuliffe, the teacher that was on the Space Shuttle Challenger from New Hampshire. You guys okay with me starting Lincoln and then picking up with him next week? Because I'm going to tell you, there's no way. Or we could just stop now and pick up with Lincoln next week. What do you guys want to do? You can't. <laughs> you can't. So we won't be able to finish Lincoln. But I can go for another 15 or 20 minutes if you guys want. Lincoln's awesome. It's up to you guys. Yeah, sure. sure. I need, like, you know, I don't want you. you're falling asleep, man. I can't have you falling asleep. What? No, no. All right. All right. So, um, Lincoln is super exciting, um, and so we're going to hit him real fast. We're going to skip, skip over um, some of this stuff. Um, as a young, uh, the thing about Lincoln, if you 
Talk about Washington and Jefferson, all the stuff they did. The only American president to hold a patent is Abraham Lincoln. He invented a little device called a cricket to jack up river boats out of the water. Watch the video. Watch the video. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Wait, out of all presidents or just those? Just the other? Out of all presidents. <laughs> out of every single president. Yeah. All right, there you go. Um, so anyway, um, well, I wonder if I should just stop. I'm going to call it right here, guys. I'm going to call it right here. Because we're going to get started, and I know I'm not going to be able to stop. I'm